most eloquently by Primo Levi in his last book, The Brown and the Save, is that that's a misnomer. You don't survive that experience. You may survive it physically, but what it does to you emotionally, mentally, psychologically, is something that can't easily be measured. And Levy was very specific about the implications of non-survival survival. As he, in the opening chapter of that book, talks about the Belgian resistance fighter Jean Amari, who survived, but after the Holocaust, committed suicide. And if it's true that Primo Levi himself did commit suicide, because that's a somewhat open question, but if so, then he's the proof of his own pudding. Forty years after surviving, it finally got to him. The 1948 definition also doesn't talk about the children of survivors or the grandchildren, the heirs of the experience of a genocidal effort and what the implications of a genocidal effort are for the next generation and the next generation. It doesn't mention the word home, for example, and how one who has experienced or who is born to those who experience, or even the grandchildren or descendants of those who have experienced genocidal efforts may never quite be able to feel home in the place from which that person came or perhaps anywhere at all. And of course, the paradox can be that the children or grandchildren of perpetrators of genocide can feel the same sense of homelessness. So there is a lot to the issue of genocide aside from the delineation of the different ways in which that term, from its Greco-Latin roots, means the attempt to absolutely destroy a given group defined as such by whatever the mechanism of defining that group racially, ethnically, religiously, and so on. And art that addresses genocide then will be art that reflects on all of these things. It's altogether another level of complexity when if one reflects as an artist on these matters, that the presentation, the results of one's reflections end up, or as the case may be, don't because they can't end up at the site where the genocide originated at the place where the attempt to eradicate the group of which the artist is part began. And so this session is one that focuses specifically on that issue among the myriad issues that one could, that could be one's focus in the matter of art and genocide. The matter of reflecting in the place, or if one cannot, why one cannot reflect in the place or how one goes around the inability to reflect in the place where a genocide has begun, been attempted, accomplished. So we have three artists with us. I'm going in alphabetical order. To my immediate left is Karen Frosty, who is an educator, who is an artist, who is an associate professor at Lesley University. She's also a visiting scholar at the Brandeis University. And who is someone who derives from a German-Jewish background. Her father was from Austria. In fact, you hold dual citizenship, do you not? So the specifics of her reflection come from the context of the Holocaust in general, and in particular, as a site where it began, Austria. And I need not remind you that Austria proved to be far more vehement than German as a site. And the question of reflecting artistically on these events and in situ. And therefore, the question would be also, and what is the audience there for such work? How does the dialogue move forward between the artist, it's a trialogue, among the artist, her art, and the audience? And Faye Rajauer, who, with respect to her work on this subject, and each of these artists, as you can imagine, does a lot of work on a lot of subjects, so I have to remember that I mean on this subject for the purposes of this panel. Faye presented this rather extraordinary exhibition in Kazimierz, the one time, going back to the 14th century, Jewish quarter of, or just, uh, just over the, just outside Krakow, Poland, and um, created a series of what amount to palimpsests, but she's going to tell you more about those. She's going to tell you what a palimpsest is as well. 
108 of them, each nine and a half inches square, in a site in Krakow. And one of the wonderful things about the site is you've got this, imagine all of these images against this brick wall. And I can't think Poland, and I can't think Krakow, a stone's throw from Auschwitz, and look at a brick wall and not think about the brick walls I've seen at Auschwitz where they line people up to shoot them. So her reflection has a very specific connection, not so to speak to Central, but to Eastern Europe with respect to that same phenomenon of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust. And Abo Tarosian, who is born, I love this, on the one hand his father is Armenian, on the other hand his mother is Greek, so he actually represents in his bloodlines the two sides, east and west, of what was then Ottoman Turkey in 1915, when this horrific genocide of Armenians occurred, in which so many perished, and which led ultimately, in the case of the survivors, physical, of his family, to Aleppo, Syria, and to make a long biographical story short, led him ultimately to migrate to the United States in 1968, I believe. And he is, among other things, a filmmaker. So in each of the cases of Faye and Karen, we're speaking about visual arts that are non-mobile. -mo non and in the case of Ambo, we're talking about a visual art that is mobile. Moreover, we're talking about a visual art that contrary to Faye and Karen's experience is being presented in the place. In his case, there are complications trying to present it in the place. So how does that reflect differently on the overall situation, aside from the difference of media? I'm going to go alphabetically and pose a question, which in fact I already have, to each of the artists, and then we're going to follow from their responses to perhaps another question or two from me and or from you, and we'll just see how it goes. We have all the time we need. So the question, in a nutshell, in a nutshell is, how in the first place, if you managed to present there, did it come about that you did, and what was the process of doing so? And I guess then, what was the response? So Karen, your lead off that. So I have actually answers to those questions. Um, I'm gonna read my presentation to stay on track with time and um, move quickly. As the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and a granddaughter of grandparents deported to Riga in 1941, my work concerns my process as an artist and scholar to reinscribe my family's memory back into Vienna. My father graduated from the University of Vienna in 1936, earning a doctorate in law and economics. Arrested by the Gestapo in 1938, he was expelled from Vienna within hours of his release. Submitting a proposal to the law school in 2006, I was granted the opportunity to install a new body of work at the University of Vienna's Juridicum in 2008. The paper addresses alternating undercurrents of trust and suspicion that framed the process of establishing the collaboration. The paper notes how institutional caution, exasperated by delays in funding, coupled with gaps in communication, stirred historic issues of distrust and replicated toxic configurations of power 70 years after the Anschluss. The paper goes on to describe the extensive round of festivities that took place on November 25, 2008. Prior to the event, I wondered, was it simply an extravagant publicity stunt, an effort to vindicate the law school from its troubled past? Did these lawyers from a country that had been notoriously reluctant to move from the position of first victim to that of perpetrator really wish to set the record straight? I knew of other failed attempts to collaborate with the law school. Was I simply the right person at the right time with a compelling story that struck a chord? Perhaps it was my status as an artist, merely the daughter of a lawyer that was so disarming, posing no real threat to the university's reputation is one of European, Europe's most distinguished institutions. Despite a number of tense inter interchanges which I highlight in this paper, the overall event was a remarkable and memorable experience. The program, billed as a commemorative event, was thoughtfully developed 
festive and solemn, dignified and poignant. Um, and if time permits, I will take a few minutes to discuss one of the 14 panels, the memory panels that I installed at the university in an effort to convey the complexity of emotional experience in the room during my keynote address. I will conclude with a brief presentation of plans underway for continued collaboration between the University of Vienna and Brandeis University. Very quickly, the project, the background to the project began in 2003 when I received a packet of letters, 68 letters written by my grandparents to my father between 1938 and 1941, before their deportation to Riga. I traveled to Vienna in 2006 to present a paper to the Social Theory, Polit Politics, and Art Conference entitled Austrian Funding Practices Regarding Post-War Legacy Projects Dealing with Holocaust Legacies. I used the conference's broad platform of cultural policy to discuss Austrian subsidies for artists tackling politically charged projects regarding Holocaust memory. Research for the paper included a number of interviews with Austrian officials, directors of foundations, activists, archivists, scholars, and arts professionals. During this trip, I met Martha Kyle, director of the Institute for History of Jews in Austria. In a conversation with her, I discussed my plans and wishes to present a body of work at the law school. Um, as luck would have it, she happened to know the deputy director of the Institute of Philosophy of Law at the university. She approached him on behalf, and he expressed interest in pursuing the idea. Evidently, the law school had been the last of the professional schools at the University of Vienna to integrate Holocaust history into the curriculum. In fact, I learned that students at the law school studied ancient Austrian law and contemporary law. They were not required to study the period of the Holocaust between 1938 and 1945, which was labeled a period of lawlessness. Issues of restitution fell into contemporary law, and furthermore, Austria did not exist formally between 1938 and 1945. My proposal triggered the law school's readiness to deal with a problematic period of history using the exhibition as a public launching pad to develop a new body of curriculum entitled Displaced Law. Through correspondence with Martha, I learned the plan would entail creating a national exhibit, international conference, and it would coincide with Kristallnacht commemorations of 2008. I requested that a letter be drafted outlining the commitment so I could pursue funding with grants and fellowships um, for the project. I made this request many times before I finally received an official letter. During the early months of the project, I was focused on developing the panels and made another trip to Vienna to meet with Professor Weishaya in 2007. We walked around the law school building, which lacked an official gallery space, trying to identify a suitable location to install the work. The building did not lend itself to an exhibit, and so the conversation was awkward as the options were less than ideal. In fact, one possibility was to install the work in the basement of the foyer under the central atrium space, acknowledging that such a setting would like to of graveyard associations. So this is hallways, this is all transitory space they offered, and then this, yes, oh, sorry. So this is the uh, space under the atrium. This is on the, your left, is where they suggested the work be shown. In the end, it was shown on the space on the right. Um, over the course of the year, a date was set for November 25th. Um, by mid-summer of 2008, um, I was eager to establish a contract with the University of Vienna outlining major points that I thought needed written confirmation. The contract was not forthcoming. I had to send multiple, multiple emails to get a contract. I wanted to have outlined copyright protections, payment, they were evidently going to pay for the fabrication of the panels, and the terms of my gift, which would include if they didn't want the panels, what would happen to them? Would they be returned to me? Dealing with lawyers, I was assured from by Martha, now a partner in the project, that in Vienna, a handshake would suffice. With no contract in place, um, and no mention of the event on the website, and only a plane ticket in hand, I was uncertain the event would take place. I explored legal counsel with U.S. copyright lawyers to the tune of $2,000, a plan I quickly abandoned. Any contract would need to have Austrian approval because it was law school, so it really needed to be generated by them. Working without a contract also implied that they trusted me. They trusted I would produce the work. They didn't ask to see the work before the panels were fabricated. Nor did they ask to read my remarks before I delivered them. Another month 
at, um, of deliberation, I picked up the phone, spoke to Dr. Weishider directly, Professor Weishider. He, to my surprise, was very congenial and assured me that all the grant money had come through and that 8,000 euros was now being dedicated to this project. I was also informed that a number of pub, um, public dignitaries would be attending the opening and speaking at the conference. And I will not read these names because they're complex, but just to give you a sense of how how much uh, work they put into this. The President of the Administrative Court was there, Chief of Justice of the Supreme Court, the Minister of Justice, the Vice Chancellor of the University, Dean of Faculty, and a renowned actor, um, Os Otto Tosic, who was a Holocaust survivor. Um, so another delicate point occurred at this point. Uh, Tosic was going to read letters to my grandparents. I'm gonna sort of finish in about, can I keep going? Okay. So Tosi was going to read my grandparents' letters as a kind of conclusion of this conference. So I was asked to send copies of, the, of a few letters, selected letters, to him in advance, or to Martha, who was going to deliver them to him. So I picked a few letters that uh, were poignant, um, that referred to a law professor who helped my father while he was detained in Cuba um, and came to my father's rescue. The letters, uh, in fact, were rejected on the grounds that the writing was not adequate for such a sophisticated audience, which <laughs> to this day is sort of shocking. Um, so instead, they got letters from the Dow to read very impersonal letters. But by rejecting my grandparents' letters, they really missed an opportunity, a symbolic opportunity, to reclaim all the lost voices of Austria's virgin citizens. With that said, the letters are actually incorporated into the panels. I'm going to very quickly just look at the images that took place at the conference itself. You can see, hmm? oh, okay. So here's posters, um, and they, you know there was a lovely um, program that was designed. Um, so it, and it was really beautifully advertised. Um, now what you can see is actually the installation of the work into the formal uh, place, the uh, the environment. Um, and you can start to see, they had a newspaper person come to interview me. You can start to see people standing around it. You can start to, if you read carefully, you can start to look at some of the anxiety in the air. People were looking at their watches, wondering how many people were coming. I mean, it was, it was a, quite a mixed moment. Um, but an exchange that's not visible in the slides um, was also unfolding. Evidently, faculty, students, and visitors were quite moved by the beauty and power of the panels. A discussion was soon underway about permanent placement of the panels. It was, um, they were to be located at the University's Institute for the Philosophy of Law in the foyer, auditorium halls, and meeting spaces. The department chair would have two panels in his office. Quite suddenly, other faculty petitioned to have panels in their offices. It was a flattering moment, but it also meant that some of the work would no longer hang in public spaces as a cohesive collection. The law school was without a gallery, so how the work was going to be distributed never was fully articulated in the contract. What I envisioned as a public setting was now becoming quite personal. How would faculty live with these panels in their offices, meeting with students under my grandparents' letters? Another startling exchange occurred between the Vice Chancellor of the University, Johan Urenich, and myself just moments before the opening remarks. He approached me to extend a formal apology for what happened to my grandparents, adding that it could happen again. I was completely taken aback by the power of his words. No public official had ever initiated a direct and personal apology for the losses my family endured. In this context, I served as proxy to my grandparents' suffering, receiving this belated acknowledgement on their behalf registered as a pivotal moment in this strange sea of disparate memories converging. I can show one image, would that be something like, and then, and then I will pause. This was actually the beginning. This is a woman bargaining, asking for having a panel in her office. This is, this is actually my family. These are the only picture that I have of my uncle. A family photo, my father and my uncle, and my father's central, and my uncle is there. This is the one panel that we'll talk about just to give you a sense. The panel is called Civil Sadism. The title is a play on words, civil meaning both polite and concerning laws within one's country and community. In short, a polite sadist acting on what he's been prescribed to do as a beautiful citizen is still a sadist. Coming to Vienna, I was struck by the presence of cobblestones everywhere. 
I was also keenly conscious of how Jews were forced to clean the cobblestones on their knees with toothbrushes and sometimes even with their tongues. These cobblestones contain the shadow of a human stain. The image focuses on the perpetrator, not the victim. I include toothbrushes, caked in cobblestones from supermarkets in Vienna, as well as the interior metal grates from the confessional booths in the beautiful Schubert Kircher in the ninth district where my father's family lived. I wondered what kinds of confessions were whispered here in 1938, as well as what kinds of benign circumstances might trigger intrusive memories about the Holocaust, such as buying a toothbrush. And these toothbrushes below are photographed in the supermarket. The inclusion of the floor tile from the hallway of my grandparents' last residence conveys the feeling that after 1938, Jews were not safe anywhere, even in their homes. So you can imagine the kind of feeling as I'm talking about these images. I didn't want to let anyone off easy in the audience. Um, the program concluded with an inspiring performance by a string quartet, creating a quiet mood of reflection and contemplation. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court spoke extemporaneously about the horror of the Holocaust. A new statistic was released that people did not know about in the room, that 80% of all Austrian lawyers vanished in 1938 were Jewish, and 50% of all the judges. In addition, a Jewish lawyer named Hans Kessel, Kelsen, wrote, wrote the Austrian Constitution in 1920, which is currently in use. Over the course of the afternoon and evening, I found myself traveling to Riga and back again, bringing my grandparents home. For the first time, I felt a glimmer of peace. I was com comforted knowing that my grandparents' voices, now memorialized in the walls of law school, would speak to a new generation of lawyers and students about the lingering lessons of the Holocaust. Their presence of their story would serve as a reminder of Austrian's past, prompting new conversations about racism and basic installation that I'm going to talk about is called Where the Past Meets the Future. I'm going to take you on a journey through parts of Poland, through parts of my mind, and it's not necessarily in chronological order. Um, as an aside, among the zillion of projects I have rolling around in my head, there's a cookbook I want to write, and it's called um, I Cook the Way I Paint. And what I'm going to do is talk all right. Um, the reason I have this picture here is because, there we go, oh. Stephen Feinstein of Blessed Memory was really the start of all of, not of my artwork, but of our coming together. Um, just to put a little frame to this, and know already as introduction did give a frame to it, but for my personal introduction, uh, my first conference at IHES was in 2005 in Florida. Uh, and it was on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Holocaust, the 90th anniversary of uh, the Armenian Genocide. Stephen Feinstein, who at the time might have been chair of the conference, he was certainly a member of the board, um, put together an artist panel, artists, Jewish artists confronting the Holocaust, and another panel, Armenian artists confronting uh, Armenian Genocide. And the committee was very careful not to have both conferences at the same time. We each got to go to each other's um, session, and we met, we, we engaged, and some of us really have remained in contact, and Apo and I are now friends. Um, and our, our um, introduction was really through Stephen Feinstein. Um, the person uh, next to Stephen, Richard Mishard or Treva, is a Polish, artist who was a child during the Holocaust from Poland, from Krakow. His father and older brother were killed in Auschwitz. His mother and sister, older sister, were in Ravensburg. He was too young, so he jumped in the countryside between rocks, and every few weeks he got the word he had to go somewhere else because people knew he was the son of. And he truly is a descendant of resistors. And he is one of the finest artists I have ever met, and I was introduced to him through Stephen. And this is at a dinner that the three of us had together in 2007 in Krakow. Um, at the time of the 2007 IHES conference, uh, there was a pre-conference symposium in Krakow. I went to that uh, conference. Uh, it was to be in Auschwitz over the weekend. 
It being my first trip to Poland, I could not justify, and I'm a Sabbath observer, I could not justify spending Sabbath in Auschwitz. I went on my own on Tuesday to uh, Krakow, spent a few days there, hooked up with everybody else when they arrived uh, at the company hotel on Friday, and I joined the group only on Sunday uh, to Auschwitz. Um, before going to Poland, I heard about the Galicia Museum in Krakow in Kazimierz, the former and now renewed, revived Jewish quarters of uh, Krakow. I made contact with them. We read them when I'm in town the week. On Saturday of that weekend, when I did not go to um, uh, Auschwitz, Stephen Feinstein and two other people and myself, four of us, walked through Krakow, through Kazimierz, through the ghetto, through Pekor. Morning, I don't know if I say it correctly, and took the four kilometer walk to Schindler's factory and back. And it was a very, very extraordinary experience. And then moving on to Sarajevo for the actual conference, um, the, the concept of this conference, of, of this session, really started there. It was extremely powerful, and if any of you were in 2007, you may agree. Being at the site and talking to university students who were children at the time, being in the place where it happened, seeing things not from what we know from our parents or grandparents, but it was right there. It happened a few years ago. It was very profound, and between being in Krakow then being in Sarajevo, and a few other things I will go along on, on this little journey, um, we, uh, the idea stemmed to deal with what is it like to go back where it came, where it started. We can show our work in Washington, we can show our work in Boston, we can show our work in Florida. It's not the same as showing the work in the place where it happened. Um, this is just um, uh, to point out one of the um, a monument in a memorial in Auschwitz on that Sunday when I was there. That might be Stephen. Um, uh, yes, that is Stephen on the steps of uh, the memorial in Auschwitz. Uh, the reason I show this to you is it's going to lead me into one of the boxes of the mosaic that I did in, uh, at the Krakow at the Valencia Museum. During the, uh, on Sunday of our Symposium Day in Auschwitz uh, in 2007, I noticed a group of Israeli students uh, just sitting on the grass, and one of them had the um, Israeli flag. I took this photo, and it ultimately became an element, I it's probably obvious, became an element in, um, in this overall nine and a half inch square mixed media piece on wood. If you visualize piece of parquet floor, and some of them are actual parquet floor, and some are constructed. They're all constructed boxes, either of parquet floor or just took a fresh piece of wood and made it a box. Um, and the idea of parquet floor is another element of memory, of recycling, of building anew, of starting again, or building on what was. In my work, everything leaves, everything is a metaphor for something else. Nothing is just Nothing is just face value or, or uh, superficial level. Um, uh, I take you back now to the streets of Krakow. I have, since that occasion in 2007, been back to Krakow multiple times. I stay in the same Campanile Hotel and do the same walk every day from the Campanile Hotel to in the center of uh, Krakow to Kazimierz, uh, and walk down this street, uh, which again has become an element. Here is the bridge at the end of Kajimirs that takes you, if you were to cross this bridge, you would be in uh, uh, Padori, the, the ghetto, and if you continue down the road, a good hour's walk, if not more, you'd be, you'd walk to uh, Schindler's factory, which of course is what Jews who were in the ghetto, who were moved to my party, who walked every day to, to the factory. That, that is their daily round trip. Um, 
And by the way, when I was at the Schindler's factory, uh, they're building a museum. And in 2007, the only thing you could see in the museum was footage of the museum. It was a very uh, roundabout uh, uh, experience. Thank you. Um, in the course of time, my, my, I'm first generation American. My family's from Holland and Belgium. So you may ask, what is this connection with Poland? Um, I did find out, and I will show you when I get there, um, that there is a Krakow connection going back several generations, and not my, not my immediate family, but going back to my grandparents and back, so that in the 19th century, and back for several hundred years, there's a long-standing great hour of presence. Um, when I was in uh, uh, Krakow uh, last summer in 2008, which is when the show opened, I uh, looked up the address, or someone helped me look up the address of what I understand to be the name of my grandfather, whom I never knew, Moshe Grajauer. And there were three listings, so I guess there were three Moshe Grajauers. And my brother is Moshe Grajauer too. And um, I went to the three addresses. One of them, I have since found out, is the uh, home, uh, was the home of a relative of mine who lives in Israel. Uh, one of them is probably, so what is 11 Yosefa, which is this street. And I actually passed these every day before I knew that they had any connection to me, or possible connection to an extended member of my family. This is one of them, 11 Yosefa. This is 52 Karkowska Street. And Karkowska Street is a very big, long street going towards the end of Kajimir, towards the bridge that I showed you a few images ago. And it's also, uh, okay, um, it influenced one of, uh, several of my boxes. Going back to the idea of home that Ori mentioned a few minutes ago. What's a home? Who's home? How do you depict home? But we're looking for home. And we're looking for home today. We're looking of yesterday. This is uh, an extract of a Yiddish uh, writing, a Yiddish newspaper behind, which is the Yiddish word for today, a white in Germany. And it's, this is, um, this box, uh, oh sorry, this box is um, a recycled parquet floor. On the reverse side, if you notice the texture here, the underside of parquet floor in order to be glued on has some kind of tar on it. So when I took apart the parquet floor, when the building where I live in Boston, the Muddy River overflowed, they replaced the floors. I salvaged, as an artist, I salvaged one person's garbage as somebody else's treasure was my treasure. And uh, I used the underside, I didn't want the smooth side, life isn't smooth. I used the rough side and built on it, hence the texture is part of the actual box at the moment that I found this wood. Um, again, um, using the idea of home and security and what is eternal, there is a phrase that I extracted from the Bible, I have built you an eternal foundation, but nobody to buy it, it's full of love. And in Hebrew, the B, B, B is it's great alliteration, and a bet, the letter bet, B, has the, the, the word Aleph, Bet, Gimel, A, B, C. The Hebrew letter bet actually means house. And the shape of the letter, oh, whatever, no. All right. Um, any of the Bs, this is a bet, this is a bet, has the suggestion of a house in the very shape of the orthography of the letter suggests a house. And the meaning of the word of the letter is house. The very word we say, alpha, beta, no, bet is house, bite. Bite is the word for house. So this is a compute combination. My work scanned into the computer, reworked, because my work is mixed media in any format. Here too, I extract elements from all kinds of sources, uh, including a torn book cover that surfaced somewhere among my things. Um, this is a very
very interesting story I would like to share. Where the past meets the future, one doesn't always know how things, where things take you. Um, several years ago, I was commissioned um, by Shula Reinhardt at the uh, women's, at the time it was the Women's International Research Center. It's the institute where Karen is, is now a scholar in residence. At the time, they had done a research project on how women around the world celebrate the holiday of Purim. And I received all the stories, all the interviews that they had collected, some photos, and I had to do whatever. And I did an installation. This is one of the elements. Years, years later, when I have the opportunity to be in Poland, I find out that the woman who, who did, this is her story about how Purim is celebrated in Warsaw in the year of, of this interview when she was a child under the communist, uh, uh, under communist times, there was no Purim. It was all done, if, if there was anything at all, it was in hiding. And here she is with her husband, her daughter, her son-in-law, and the marvel that all these children are in Hebrew school or Jewish school in Warsaw in the year that this project took place and I extracted some of her words and included it in the box. What I didn't know where the past meets the future was that several years later I would have an opportunity to show at the Galicia Museum in Krakow, Poland and meet Bella. That is Bella. I it was it was just an amazing experience. Uh, and she lives in Warsaw. She teaches Jewish studies. She was at the uh, she was at my opening a because I tracked her down and told her, and b uh, my exhibit opened at the time of the international festival in Krakow. Now, people who are victims of genocide are not born victims of genocide. They really have a life before and survivors in their future life after, and of course, memories and the important elements. So in some of my abstract visuals, I depict elements of things that I found in books, pictures, or stories, and this is an example. Um, I will highlight this one because of the one that comes after, which is um, I picked up some elements of different images. This is a uh, store sign in pre-Holocaust pre Krakow, um, uh, a storekeeper selling his kala, special bread for the Sabbath, and uh, it's written in Yiddish, and it says kala uh, for Shabbat, and it includes egg kala, and this is a very good kala. It's a very good and nice looking kala. That's what it says in this little sign. Um, I juxtaposed it with a young child who went to to the synagogue to find the the uh, I guess we call the sexton to bring the Torah, the Bible, which is wrapped in a tali to the prayer shawl, because someone in her family was sitting shiva, someone in her family passed away, and they needed the Torah to complete the services in the house of mourning. And I juxtaposed it with some old buildings and streets of Krakow and my own work and texture. And in May of 2008, there was an article in the New York Times of a scribe in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, who um, restores saved Bibles, Torahs, uh, 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 Bibles that were desecrated but survived during the Holocaust. He restores them and different communities throughout the world have them as memorial Torahs. Some of you may have seen Torahs and synagogues uh, in a case as memorial. And I juxtaposed this elements of the New, of the New York Times article from Auschwitz, a Torah as strong as its spirit. That was the title of the article with the hand of the scribe and working on parchment with other elements of the way I work. And I juxtaposed that to the box, the, the image that I just showed you of 
where the past meets the future. Now, I mentioned a prayer shawl, which ends up being a, um, a uh, motif, both in something that inspired me and something that I discovered at the museum, which I wouldn't have known while I was doing my work. This is a photo that, this is an image of a photo on display that Chris Schwartz, the founding, founding director of the Galicia Museum took when he took images of uh, Krakow and around Poland. He passed away the year that I visited in 2007. This was very uh, moving for me because the entrance of the museum, which is a former uh, Coke factory, has on its entry on the glass in Hebrew and in uh, Polish and in English, my country wrapped up in light, like a prayer shawl, and in Hebrew, otafa artsi or talit. This is a phrase from a Polish uh, poet, Avraham Szlansky, and, and they used it at the museum. And here's a photo of talit uh, hanging to dry uh, that Chris Schwartz took. And this is a book that I found about 16 years ago at the International Book Festival in Jerusalem when I was visiting. This book was, I saw the book from the distance, and this is the part I saw. I saw the spine. I saw just the black and white element of the book, and it was sitting among leather-bound uh, books in a section where the um, just the person who was showing the work was showing the hand-tooled leather covers that was his specialty. And if you had an old book, you wanted to have it rebound, he's the person to go to. Except that there was this one black and white, what I thought was uh, a love frank mother well painting. And I didn't understand what that was doing among these leather books. I asked to see it. I began to look at it. I opened up the pages. And I found, and I don't know why I was reading it, that in itself is very strange. But when I got to the bottom of the second page, I saw the bottom name is Avraham Meir Ryover. Ryover is great shower, this is written in Hebrew. And if you see on top, for anybody who reads Hebrew, Haskamta Dedina Rabba de Krakow. Unbeknownst to me, Avraham Meir Ryover. All great showers are related. Abraham Ryover was the Dayan, the rabbinic judge in 1881 in Krakow. So here I am, just coming off the plane from Boston, I'm walking through this book fair with thousands and thousands of book, books, and I hit the jackpot and found this book. So needless to say, I bought the book, and it was in a brown paper bag for years years, until 2007, when I knew I was going to Krakow, when I knew I was going to Sarajevo, and a light went off in my head, take this book with you. And I literally carried the book with me on the airplane, and just physically needed to have it in Krakow, and then brought it back home. But that is also what inspired me to uh, start this project. One, another element I will share on my all right, um, I will go quickly. Uh, a Haggadah, a uh, uh, Passover that I have, was done in Israel in 1967 after the Six Day War. And it's called From Darkness to Light. And then among my research items of looking for images, I came across a front piece of a Haggadah that people in a labor camp did from memory. And they hand wrote the same thing, from darkness to light. So I extracted that and embedded that in one of my boxes. Quickly taking me through back to Poland, the Wawel Palace is, is you know, one of the highlight things that tourists go to see. It was also the Nazi headquarter in Krakow at the time. And this is something that factored into one of my boxes as well. Uh, if my my uh, exhibit opened at the time of the International Festival, and it is absolutely mind-boggling to see hundreds 
of voices, literal voices, singers, oh, sorry, singers, including some very famous uh, cantors, gathered together in the restored old synagogue in uh, Kashmir perform. I also attended during the festival a poetry meeting in um, as part of their uh, festival, it was poetry meeting in Polish. And I tried to understand what is a Polish poetry meeting in Krakow during a Jewish festival. I probably was the only non-speaking Pole and perhaps even the only American present. And I, I just needed to breathe their air. It was wall-to-wall -wall people. If you can see this window, this is an internal window. And people were sitting on the other side of this window because there wasn't a room to let everybody in. It was mostly older people. There were actors reciting, and they were reciting in Polish poetry uh, from Jewish authors. One of the most moving things, uh, let's see if you can see that here, was well, the cantor. Yeah, the cantor. Then Sion Miller, who was born in a DP camp, is a very renowned cantor in Brooklyn, New York today, um, actually was part of the festival, part of the poetry meeting, and he sang an excerpt from the Bible. And that particular excerpt will never sound uh, the same again, having heard it in the context of a Polish poetry meeting. This is to take you back to the Galicia Museum the space that I had, um, I had a floor plan, uh, handwritten like this. I went to see the site when I was, the first time I was there. There too, my choices were quite limited. I was given, unless I was willing to wait a year or two, I was given a uh, brick wall with girders in between, and there's a cafe over here. And I decided I could work with it. It would actually inspire my work because stones, as always already said, is a metaphor many times over. And as my work is uh, a mosaic of sorts and every story is another stone, it was a metaphor on top of a metaphor. Um, and this is uh, the installation with um, somebody speaking uh, at my installation. Mark Langer, when I first met him, was the director of the Kultur House in Potsdam, where I showed years ago when I showed in Germany. He today teaches German in Poland and at a university, and I knew he was in Krakow, so he was the uh, speaker at my opening. Here is the installation. Uh, the work was very well received. It was so well received that the American consul in Krakow came to the opening and offered to travel my show. This is uh, the installation when it moved to the Auschwitz Jewish Museum. This is the second cemetery in Auschwitz, the first cemetery in Auschwitz. The first cemetery was totally uh, demolished. The stones uh, of the cemetery were used to build the Auschwitz concentration camp. The stones in this second cemetery do not necessarily stand on top of the body being remembered, and some of the stones were so broken up that monuments were made of stones. So here's an example of a memorial of multiple pieces of stones. It's not any one person, and who knows who's under there. I'm out of time, all right? This is the students at the Auschwitz Jewish Center, the hospital taking me back, eBay, Correspondence from 1940 that I found that found its way into my work. And finally, there are very few Jews left in Poland. Poland has a very complicated history with the highest uh, number of concentration camps, all the concentration camps were in Poland, the highest number of Jews and people at large killed, the highest number of perpetrators, and the highest number of people who actually tried to save Jews. Thank you. Before I speak about my art and what I do, what influences me and our common goals, I just want to mention Steve Feinstein's memory to him too, because we owe him this event. Thanks to Faye, we got together. 
uh, Steve Feinstein was a pioneer in his career. And one of his best contributions to the academia in the United States, he created a system that he could afford to have such an historian, which was uh, a groundbreaking historian. His name was Taner Akchum. He still lives right now in Massachusetts. Good friend. And Taner was telling me about Steve. Now, you have to realize this. People, every day, they're, talk they're talking and studying genocide. It's such a gruesome story to follow. Steve had one rule that Paul Tunner he wanted a joke every morning. That was Steve. And if you remember, he was always making fun from even disastrous situations when he had technical problems and all that. He always had a joke. It amazes me that as a human being, how we can find creative reason to kill each other through history. And so far, nothing has changed. Of course, there's hope. But we're still following the same track. And that part, of course, affects me because I'm a second generation survivor of the Armenian genocide. My father never wanted to talk about it. If I asked him, he would get kind of angry and say, there's no God. If there was God, what happened would never have happened. But that doesn't mean that he was not a decent man, because he didn't follow the route that most of People do. He was a decent man. He was an honest man. High values. High integrity. That's what I learned from him. And uh, he has been an influence in my work. Indirectly. Even though he didn't talk about it, I heard the story. Because grown ups. They talk to each other, survivors. So of course I was playing with my marbles in the living room on the floor while they're talking. So they didn't realize I could hear stories. So I was born in Istanbul, Constantinople, the capital of two empires, the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire than the Ottoman Empire. And I grew up with an incredible history surrounding me. Every corner, I mean, you see a wall that's 2,000 years old. It's not that like 200 years. Uh, my education was my self-determination. My father didn't believe in education. He said, go and be a merchant by itself. Especially as an artist. Don't be an artist. You'll start to death for the rest of your life. But of course I was rebellious. So I did live 26 years in that city. I had a lot of Turkish friends. I had a lot of cases that I did learn that I was different. I didn't know when I was growing up. My family never told me that. When I went out there, and they asked my name, and suddenly the reaction was different. Persons are looking at me and said, oh, my uh, Turkish name is Abraham, Armenian is Abraham, and Abo is the short version. So right away, I was different. 
I was lucky to go to an art school that I had very liberal minded educated friends. But the unfortunate part, the country that I grew up was and still is a very racist society. on ethnicity was a routine, normal thing. I'll give you an example. Today, the worst swear in Turkey is to call somebody Armenian. My constant, the famous book from Hitler, is number one seller. Hate is praised by the government. They call it Turkishness. A lot of my friends, including Tanner Aksha, and including myself, uh, we are traitors because we spoke up about what happened. I had a large group of Turkish friends in this country. The year was 2003. I was asked to make a presentation about Armenian genocide. Being a visual person, up to that time, I was exhibiting my artwork, which once we run this, you will have an idea. I used bread as a metaphor, which was used as a weapon to kill my ancestors. And earth, I use earth in the installation. Uh, anyway, being visual, I said, I have to bring something visual. What can I do? I grabbed the camera, which I didn't know how to use, the video camera. A friend of mine showed me how to use it. A month later, I was in Turkey visiting my father's village. Now, it might sound very simple and easy to do, but it's not in Turkey. With my identity, you have to realize I did escape from Turkey when I was 26 years old. I did not do my military service. That's a big no-no. I gave up my Turkish citizenship, hoping that the day will come that I'll be able to visit my country. It took me 27 years to get to that point. So I did go to my father's village. I have family history, letters from my uncle. And from those memoirs, I could find my father's place. The sad part was the house was not there. My grandfather's coffee shop was there was not there. So I recorded uh, the children of the perpetrators. My Turkish is very good, so they figured out that I was a Turkish uh, movie maker interviewing them. And uh, at my grandfather's coffee shop, right there. Uh, then I made the movie. I made a movie and I showed the movie. This whole thing happened within like three, four months. It was an incredible work, 18 hours a day. And that's where everything changed in my life. Just that one presentation, everything changed. I knew it was coming. I knew when I started talking about the Armenian genocide that all my Turkish friends, hoping that we will create a dialogue and a relation, because I believe that the dialogue, we can solve our past problems and create a new future. I knew they were not going to talk to me, and that's what happened. I lost them all. Uh, I lost my rights to go home. But you know from everything you lose, you 
learned something, and what I learned in my bus is I have a very powerful tool in my hand. Now you have to realize I did installations, I did show my artwork in multimedia exhibitions I had. One of them was at the Holocaust Museum. I had four movies going at the same time. Uh, I had an installation going on the floor which involves the visitors. So the show was new every single day. Plus my work on the wall. But there was something missing. My story was not heard. How many people can visit you if at the museum? That's that's the maximum reach. We want to give a message to the new generation, our colleagues. But I can find out a tiny little DVD has much more power than any other art form, in my opinion. Because you can send a DVD to a television station. And in half an hour to one hour, we have 150,000 people you are reaching. You're educating 150,000 people in one hour or less. Not only that, what gave me the opportunity is I can show those films in the country that I'm discriminating in a country that I cannot be there myself. My film can be there. Right now, they are being uh, translated to Turkish subtitles. And it's going to be shown. I cannot tell you where. I cannot tell you when. Because three years ago, uh, you might have probably heard of his name. His name is Raghav Zaragolu is a uh, very active uh, publisher in Turkey, which he has published a lot of books from Armenian, from English to Turkish, about the Armenian genocide, about the Holocaust, you name it. And those books are selling in Turkey, and he's facing uh, court cases and jail cases. And he wrote a little uh, article about the film that was going to be shown in Turkey at the Human Rights Center. The name of the film was Voices. And he was here. He was in America at that time. And he sent the film and says, you guys handle that? And next thing you know, we received an email from Turkey saying that we cannot show the film. They did find out that Show it. They're going to bomb the place. That's the power. In another way, I feel that I can do a lot if I'm not being there. Uh, my last word is. It's about uh, Henry Morgoth, and the premiere was going to be in Athens last September. I was invited. I was commissioned to do this film. And uh, being so close to Turkey, you travel for seventy-five dollars. You can cross the water and be in Greece. My daughter. With her family, my two grandchildren, lives in this town. I came to visit them for the last time in this. But I learned one thing, and that was my father. No hate. No hate. Hope is the only way. So, Uh, probably 
we can't just run the bread series and we have an idea. By the way, this is the cover of my father's village. The bread series is, as I said, it's metaphoric. It's, I use bread itself and found objects and it, it, it takes a time, you know, like this is a six months work, to be honest. It be simple, like it's a six months work because I have to petrify the bread so it doesn't go bad. I mean, it's a lot, it's an organic material. And I use it uh, with mixed media uh, subjects and objects of uh, found objects. And uh, uh, the paintings are hung on the wall with a black strip, black strip goes all around the gallery sim symbolically of mourning, you know, like we put a black band on our, sh on our arm. And uh, the floor has large mounds of earth. And, and, and on each earth mound, I have newspapers. Sorry. I mean, if you want to watch the video now, and we... Said because I'm like uh, marked, I mean, the 
no more. Words, my friends cannot respond to my emails from Turkey. But you know what? They were in the crowd. They came to my presentation. For me, it was immortal. They told me. I knew it. They told me. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, respond to my event. So those are the prices you pay. The good part is, I can't believe how powerful the internet is. I mean, people are seeing my work all over the world. I'm not there. I've never been in North Dakota, but they're seeing it. I've never been in Australia, they're seeing it. I've never been in South America, they're seeing it. That's the power of tiny little DVD that is in our form. And I find that very uh, effective. Yes, yes, correct. Actually, yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, we're going to show a trailer, which is only three and a half minutes, which you can see the same thing in higher quality in my website. Unfortunately, the quality is not that great here. Uh, but tomorrow night, we're going to show two of my films. Uh, first one is going to be the Morgan of the Story, and it's 56 minutes long. And the second one is Voices which is 40 minutes long. Uh, more of those story, uh, I'm interviewing the grandchildren of Henry Morgenthau, senior, the US ambassador that was US ambassador in Istanbul, in Constantinople, from 1913 to 1917. And uh, then he quit his job, he couldn't handle the uh, killings. So he came back and wrote his book, so I interviewed his grandchildren. Uh, one of them is a DA in New York City, was the longest government person working in our government, 35 years. And the other one is uh, Henry Morgan III, which is a producer, director, uh, author. And the third one is the great-granddaughter of Henry Morgan Dr. Ben Steiner. So it was an ordeal to get those people online and make connection and make the film. Yes? Are any of those people related to the Morgan that served as uh, an FDR staff? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, that was the treasurer. Right. The treasury secretary, that was the son. And his grandsons are the ones that I'm interviewing in the film. Because I have heard that uh, the Treasury Secretary did not do as much as many Jewish people would like um, to speak out against the Holocaust and Hitler's uh, you know, actions towards the Jews. And yet his father was in Armenia, I mean, you know, seeing yes. Armenian genocide. So do you have any insight to that? Well, any of you? Uh, personally, I don't. I mean, my, my, my whole uh, study was with the grandchildren of what they said. I didn't go beyond that to extend the film because I didn't have the funds to do that. You know, otherwise, I mean, uh, it took me two years to do whatever I did, but it could take me another four years to finish it up if I could do it financially. So. Uh, but the film has an extensive study of what the family had as a contribution. And uh, especially uh, the part that is not too uh, familiar is the Greek story behind, you know, what happened to the Greeks. Because, I mean, and up to recent, governments were not, or society or historians were not recognizing the Greek genocide. It was a debate. Uh, I believe personally uh, there's politics behind because Greece and Turkey want to get along with each other and Greece hushes it up. You know, they know the Turkish reaction how it would be. But Greece and the United States, they don't think like that and they want to bring it up. And so I was the 
code for that. Uh, Morgan Thau and the other Jews who were close to FDR were under a lot of pressure to keep their mouths shut. I know. And they were know, being I told was that. I if they had any insight. Yeah. Oh, you mean they? The differential. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because the grandson was, as the DA, uh, very active in the um, efforts to deal with art that was planted by the Nazis. You may remember a case about eight years ago with uh, two paintings from Vienna that were due to go back, having been on exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, and it was more than that who stepped in and uh, two claims had been put in by two different families for those paintings. He's the one who's, who stepped in to prevent their, to delay their going back until the issue could be worked out. Um, so, he's never said anything about his father, he never worked with them. Yes, yes they do. But uh, they, they, they had a very liberal view about Judaism, about Israel, about the uh, United States, the relations, uh, how the United States did not do anything for the Holocaust survivors after the Holocaust. Uh, and so they, but they have a very intelligent and healthy vision, so I, I recommend you see it. Himself was under pressure from a whole range of, uh, of American organizations not to not to the, the excuse was do not distract us from the war effort of trying to defeat the Germans by expending too much energy and interest or effort with respect to the Holocaust. I'm making a distinction, therefore, between the Holocaust and World War II, and of course. In the, in, since Arthur Moore's book in, 19, in the mid-1960s, while Six Million died, and up through uh, a series of others that have emerged since that time, there's been a lot of discussion of the various ways in which the Americans and the Brits, um, who might have, without much cost to their war effort, done things they didn't do to save Jews, um, and the grounds that were being offered back then were, well, we've got to focus our efforts on the war. Um, and people like Morgan Thau, Stephen Wise, and uh, other leaders in the American Jewish community who were, had become aware of what was going on were under pressure to keep their mouths shut. Whether they should or shouldn't, I can't judge. I wasn't there. I, I was not in their shoes. But they were. I'm familiar with the controversy, and yeah. the expression was a little too facile, I thought. It's, it's a far more complicated yes. psychological issue to be going on. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I was just told that there's a class here that's supposed to okay. start Okay, and, and our time is up anyway. Can, so. can we just show the trailer? It's only three and a half minutes. Oh, we're back. Thank you. 